The Air Max 95 was the very first Nike that had a visible air unit in the forefoot. And this shoe caused a riot. So we're gonna cut this thing in half, run it through the test to figure out if there's actually pressure in the air units. How easy is it to pop? How much air is inside of there? Does the air actually do anything? And once it's popped, are they still wearable? And most importantly, why did this random shoe cause a riot? This video is sponsored by Bright Cellar, a cool brand that's combating wine snobbery. And they'll send you a box of personalized wine every single month. And to be honest, I'm not much of a wine connoisseur. And that's why I like stuff like Bright Cellars because it's a perfect way for people like me who don't have the time to learn an entire industry and get a taste for something because they give you a seven question quiz and they match the wine to your taste to help curate your palate. And you can choose from 12 different plan options and you get 100 plus varietals from 80 plus wine regions delivered right to your doorstep and each box comes with an educational card that outlines tasting notes, pairings, best serving temperatures, and origins, which to me, like I said, is the one thing that I just struggle with with any of this kind of stuff. I'm just like, oh, just all tastes like wine or coffee to me. But this makes it so much easier to actually learn and enjoy the stuff that you buy. And now that it's summer, there's plenty of reasons to get Bright Cellar while you're lounging at the pool or grilling out with your friends, trying new and unique wines that you couldn't find anywhere else. And honestly, these cards make this whole thing super intriguing to me because you could have people over and you can go through this whole box and each taste it and kind of start developing that pattern palette and the taste for this wine. So thanks to Bright Cellar for giving my followers the first six bottle subscription box that's usually $150 for only $70. So just click the link in the description and take the quiz and get started today. Thanks again to Bright Cellar. Well, to understand how this shoe started to riot, you have to understand the history that all started on March 26, 1987, when Nike releases the Air Max 1 that started the whole visible air unit air tech trend that we cut apart last week. Go watch that if you haven't. And this shoe was designed by the world famous Tinker Hatfield. Fast forward to 1990 and shoe designer Sergio Lozano started working at Nike on certain projects like Nike ACG, tennis and training lines. And then over the next few years, Nike released a few more Air Maxes with 1991, the Air Max 180, 91 as well, the Air Max BW, in 93, the Air Max 93. And then in 1994, Tinker Hatfield that designed the Air Max 1, leaves the Air Max line and leaves the whole project to Sergio Lozano. And so Sergio went to work on the next iteration of the Air Max line, which would be the Air Max 95. And then in early 1995, the design for the Air Max 95 was finalized and and Sergio had this to say about the design. Nike focused mostly on 90 shoes, primarily basketball shoes, and Nike's running design team strongly encouraged him to take a risk and have fun with the design and bring the focus back to Nike's performance running category. And Lozano said that he took inspiration from the eroding layers of rock, like the striations in the Grand Canyon and the human body. So the midsole allegedly represents the spine, the gradual panels represents muscles, and the laces represent the ribs. And after all the design work and concepting, in mid-1995, the shoe was released to the public. And how was the reception? Not great. Not a huge success right off the bat. And, and there was a lot of opposition to this design for whatever reason. And Lozano said there were lovers and haters, but you know you're onto something when you get that kind of emotional reaction. But fortunately, over time, it did become popular with certain youth groups and cultures, especially in Europe and Australia. It was also worn and adopted by famous rappers like The Game, Danny Brown, Gucci Mane. So now looking at the history, how did this cause a riot? Well, in the year 2000, some defects in the shoe led to the air unit squeaking with every single step. And as soon as that started happening, there was a report on the British TV show Watch Dogs that encouraged owners to return the shoes to Foot Locker where the riot took place. And because of the chaos that happened there and the owners that were riled up by the TV show and wanted to get their money back, where eight people got arrested and one police officer got injured. So a fairly sizable riot over a single shoe. So I found it kind of interesting that the tech that put the shoe on the map was also the tech that caused a riot about the shoe. And my favorite fact about this shoe was in the mid 2000s, according to forensic science reports from the UK, the Air Max 95 were an incredibly common shoe in crime scenes. And it wasn't just a small amount. It was, according to them, 8% of typical pattern frequency distribution for footwear marks from the UK police force made up of the Air Max 95s alone. So a pretty controversial history for literally no reason. Because fast forward to today, and the Air Max 95s are still extremely popular, and they've been popular over the last 20 years with this really popular colorway of the gray and green being released 10 times over the last 20 years. And it really popped off in 2018 for whatever reason, as you can see by this trend line of Google Trends. And it's still riding that wave of success to where you still pe see people wearing these all over the place. 
So is this tech that caused a riot that was also innovative actually tech or is it just a gimmick? We'll start going through this shoe, starting with the shoe information first. Well, obviously the brand is Nike. The style is the Air Max 95. They weigh one pound, they retail for $175 and they're made in Indonesia. And so if we start with the upper of the shoe, once again, just like the Air Max ones, not a panel of leather in sight. It's all fake leather. And it's slightly better than the pajama feeling fabric of the Air, Air Max ones, but just barely. And so to double check if all these panels are fake leather, we put the lighter to them and every single one of these panels is fake leather. And there is quite literally not a single piece of leather on this entire shoe, which is a bummer for me as a professional leather worker and someone that loves leather a lot. And fake leather is fine. It can perform just fine, but it's just never going to be quite as strong as a nice piece of leather. But one thing that does look pretty strong on this shoe is these, these eyelets, because most of the time you see literal eyelets where this is, looks like a nylon strap. So we wanted to do the lace pull test and it took 162 pounds to pull through, which doesn't sound like a lot, but compared to the other results, it is quite high. And then if you look at the inside of the shoe, you can see it's a pretty standard Nike shoe. You've got this terry cloth looking material for the lining and you've got a pretty cheap insole and underneath of the just the open cell foam insole you've got a typical lasting board that's strobel stitched but the interesting part of the shoe is all the midsole and outsole because it is fairly complex because you have a lot of foam throughout the midsole with two visible air units and what seems to be a plastic shank running along the shank area of the shoe so let's first see if this is actually a shank if it makes it more rigid and if i can actually just break it in half with just a classic try to break the shank test. So not fragile at all. And, you know, bending this a few times to see if it starts to look like it's gonna break, like when you bend plastic or a wire over and over. And it does feel like it adds some rigidity to the shoe. So that seems like it does work as a real shank. We'll see when you get it cut in half, how thick it actually is. That'll tell us more of how supportive it really is gonna be. But from everything off the bat, not bad. And now to the biggest, and like the, to me, the most interesting thing in this entire video, and that's the air units. Is there actual pressure inside of these? Well, if you remember, the Air Max 1 had somewhere around 10 PSI, and this test is less about the exact PSI because it's like a ball gauge with a sharpened ball needle on the end, but it's more about seeing if it actually has some pressure in there or if it's just ambient air pressure. So the Air Max 1 had pressure at 10 PSI. So we tested the Air Max 95 and the heel pressure came in at 18 PSI. So very pressurized on the heel. And then the toe, which even to the touch, feels like there's almost nothing on the inside of here. This one came in at a four shore A. So Oof, a little on the edge there, not a whole lot of pressure in there. I'm not sure if it is enough to actually make a difference above and beyond what the columns are doing for this. So we'll see with some of the other tests, but as to air volume on the inside of here, the Air Max 1 had 80 cc's and we're gonna, we're gonna build a chart. It's probably right here already. If you compare the 80 cc's to the Air Max 95, the heel only has 50 cc's and the toe has a surprising amount at 40 cc's. But what about how easy this is to pop? Because that's always my main concern with any of these Air Wear shoes or these Air Max shoes is, what if I just step off a curb weird or I step on a nail? Well, the Air Max 1's came in at a 31 pounds to puncture through, where the 95's took a pretty solid 77.5 pounds to pierce through this air unit and 43 at the ball of the foot. So better than the Air Max 1's. So on our Air Max shoe statistic chart, you can see that it did perform quite a bit better than the Air Max 1. And now that it's popped, does the air actually affect the performance of the shoe? Can you pop these and still basically feel like you have a Air Max 95 on? So we did the ball drop first and the unpopped bounced up 10.8 inches versus the pop bounced up 9.3 inches. So less responsive than the Air Max ones, but a lot less of a drop between the popped and unpopped. Then we did the bar drop test next and the unpopped bounced up 8.25 inches and the pop bounced up eight inches. So not a lot of difference between popped and unpopped when it comes to the test. And it still definitely feels like it's a little bit of a deflated tire and you can feel the sagginess and the lack of response. So it seems like it does add some feeling performance to this. But how does that compare to how it actually feels on foot? Well, a few of us in the shop wore one popped on one foot and non-popped on the other. And you can feel a difference. You know, it definitely feels like it's been deflated and there's a little bit more of that walking and quicksand feel. But does that mean that you couldn't wear these if you popped them? Well, based off all the tests that we did and wearing them, you could still definitely wear these if you popped them. It's just not gonna be nearly as responsive and comfortable, but it definitely doesn't ruin the wearability of the shoe. And to see how real world puncturable these air units are, rather than puncturing through the sidewall, how many pounds does it take to puncture through the bottom of the shoe into the air unit? 
Well, the Air Max 1 took 85 pounds, not the most impressive results. Well, fortunately, the 95 outperformed it because it took 100.5 pounds to puncture through. Still maybe not safe enough if you're walking on thumbtacks and nails to not pop the air unit, but at least it has a little bit more protection than the Air Max 1. So now let's cut these in half, see what's on the inside, and see if Nike's hiding anything else inside of the shoe. Aramir would have remembered his father's need. He would have brought me a kingly gift. All right, we got them cut in half, and if you're not subscribed, consider doing it because that's how we pay for brand new shoes, just to get cut in half so that you guys can see all the BS that these brands are hiding inside of their shoes, and if some of this tech is actually real world tech, or if it's all just a gimmick. So, let's see what's inside. So there is one thing I, I would never would have noticed unless we cut this in half, and it's that there's an internal chamber right underneath of your heel. Because from the outside, I just thought it was a bubble that wrapped around, and that, that was it, and that's why I was kind of questioning the gimmicky aspect of this. But there is air pretty much all the way under your foot, including under your heel. As for the four foot air unit, you know, it's a lot smaller, it's just tubes that run through. I still think it's, it's gonna give you a difference, we saw that in the performance of how they actually feel under foot, but it's a lot less, impressive than the heel air unit. And as for the shank, it does look like this shank is thick enough and it feels rigid enough that it actually adds some rigidity and support to the shoe. Not nearly as much as a steel shank or a real shank, but it is gonna add a, a little bit more stability. So I wonder if that's part of why these are so popular today, because they seem like they are a pretty comfortable shoe. So now to the big questions. Are the air units pressurized? Pretty clearly they are. The forefoot, not nearly as much, but there's still some pressure in it. You can hear it hiss as we pulled the, the puncture out. How easy is it to puncture? Still fairly easy, but not nearly as easy as the Air Max ones. Then how much air is in there? About 90 cc's. Does the air actually do something? It does. It seems like there is a performance difference and a, a noticeable feel difference between the two. Is it wearable if you pop them? Yeah, I think it's pretty wearable still. It's gonna be a little saggy and walking in quicksand, but you can wear them. Um, and then to the final question, is the shoe worth the $175 that Nike charges? I think it's similar to the Air Max ones where if you view it from a piece of history, wanting to wear a retro shoe to feel what technology underfoot felt like 20 or 30 years ago, I could see how someone would want to own a piece of history and own some vintage tech. But if you take away the brand and you take away the hype behind it and the history, I don't think you're getting that much more performance. I think you're actually getting less performance than basically any other modern shoe with modern tech. I don't think it's any more comfortable than modern shoes. If anything, it's a little bit harder because of these air units. They are a little bit hard underfoot, especially compared to the ridiculous foam in modern shoes. And durability wise, you do have that potential fail spot of the air units that doesn't make them unwearable, but it's not gonna be super comfortable. So for me, as a shoe, as is, not worth $175. But if you like the design and the history of it, I could see how someone could easily spend 175 bucks on these. Maybe just not the smartest use of your money. So let me know what you guys think and what other Air Maxes you want us to cut apart so we can keep this um, Air Max statistic sheet going. Because I like looking at this entire technology line through this series of hitting the big hitters and what's changed from shoe to shoe, what technology changed, and is it actually improving or are they just showing some of the tech? Because a lot of this, the difference between these two shoes, seems like it's just that little window cut out. So not a lot of actual performance innovation, a lot more of just the look innovation. So let me know what you guys think and if you're not subscribed, consider doing it and check out our other two channels and thank you guys for everything you do. See ya.